Yeah, at least we're on the same page. <laughs> Welcome to the Growing with Fishes podcast, episode two hundred and one. Um, <laughs> it's a funny little way to start the show. Um, anyways, uh, uh, we had a really awesome episode last week. We had a whole bunch of friends of the show uh, on, and uh, we'll have a bunch of really awesome guests. We have some pretty cool guests lined up. Uh, it's a couple of surprises couple of funky people that have helped support the cannabis industry that they think maybe uh, are slightly outside of the realm that we normally cover, but but uh, but some cool stuff in the, in the works and in the pipeline for guests. Um, tonight, though, we figure we'd try to do a QA. and a um, It's been a little while since we've done a question and answer, and uh, we get a lot of cool content. Uh, before that, uh, we figured we'd cover uh, uh, what we're up to. So why don't you introduce yourself, Roger, and then uh, what you've been up to lately, and then uh, I'll cover what we've been up to lately here at the farm, and then we'll take some uh, some listener questions tonight. Okay. Well, um, I'm Roger, and I'm from ilovegrowingmarijuana.com, along with our, well, our new website, ilovegrowing.com, which we're going to share a lot of more on the food-based uh, area of it and everything. We're going to be wide open. Um, I also... Uh, actually, it's ilovegrowing.net, sorry. And uh, we've been rebuilding our farm after after several years of me having physical uh, problems. And, you know, and um, as a lot of you know, I'm legally blind. Uh, we got a crew and some partners, and we're working out a great, we've got a, worked out a great um, community here. And we're starting to rebuild the farm and spreading it around and sharing and helping everybody to build their own little garden in their in their at their home or whatever aside from the farm uh that's been going great and i went ahead and bit the bullet um i had a a, a really nice uh network built uh for grow support and support of all kinds of thing agriculture and and good life and health and uh community that got hacked years ago and I, we bit the bullet and spent the money. And so we got that back up this week. So basically in that, I've got a thousand plants outside that are vegetables because I'm not in a legal state. So uh, we are, I'm really happy to say we built a little uh, propagation seedling uh, preparatory greenhouse this past week. Thank you, Ryan, you know, shout out to my partner. Um, uh, we're both uh, fans and members of the Regenerative Organic Cannabis Conference family. And uh, yeah, I guess that's about it, Steve. Uh, I, I, you know, you all know me. I, I'm, I'm the uh, Ed McMahon to Steve Johnny Carson. Absolutely. Sorry, trying to, to answer or... Uh post everything up in the beginning of the episode you know how it is getting everything up and running what's up everybody um, yeah I, I could keep talking so if you're still playing <laughs> oh no that's fine uh so we've been uh uh up and running here i'm out in oklahoma at organic innovations um, they provide uh concentrate in fact and i think we get our next round of diamonds back tomorrow um from our latest batch of uh from the flowering room which we took down I don't remember. All these days start to blur together when you start getting up this early. We started getting up super early because the days are getting hot. By the way, if you're if you're running a high temperature farm or a farm in high areas, start at 3 a.m. All of our lights come on for veg in 3 a.m. So we'll, we'll start real early and uh, we can work in the dark and then just work just a couple of hours in the, in the actual daylight time uh, when it's actually hot out. So, uh, you know, we're finishing our day up by 11 or 12 o'clock and, uh, and uh, we don't have to actually suffer through the heat. So it actually uh, makes life a lot easier for everyone. Um, we're currently in the middle of planting out uh, five acres. So we might end up doing a little bit more than that. Uh, actually, uh, now looking at the layout, I think we're gonna end up doing slightly beyond that. Um, but uh, <coughs> we're, we're looking at planting somewhere between 14,000, 14,500 plants, um, which is gonna be uh, a lot of fun to get in the ground. Uh, we have citrus sap, um, Alaskan purple, slurricane, uh, Durban poison, Durban poison grape, or it's called Durb or Durban Durb grape X, Durb X, something like that. Um, what else do we have strain wise? Some wedding cake, although I'm almost afraid to put too much of that on the outdoor because 
such a f fragile strain. Um, and then we have a whole bunch of other cool stuff, some GMO cookies, some pure, pure uh, Kush, uh, some other really awesome um, uh, strains as well. We have some G13 hash plant from uh, Dragonfly. We have some, uh, some other really cool surprises that, that I'll be showing you guys a little later. Uh, some GWB uh, Afghan uh, and some other cool stuff uh, as well. Uh, I'm trying to think of what else is out there. I'll have to go do a video just on the strains that we have. But um, that'll be a lot of fun. <coughs> I think we're going to end up building a little raft boat. Um, like People keep asking me if we're going to put some uh, DWC raft beds. We have these giant, you know, those giant plants. Uh, on the rafts there, and they're getting kind of big. Even should be pruned, for, even us with us heavily pruning them as moms, they're still kind of. I mean, they're they're outgrowing our ability to chop them and and to to literally store all the clones that we're getting off of them right now. With two buildings, uh, we're running out of space. It's kind of insane. So uh, right now, uh, we are probably going to uh, take a couple of those and put build a little ship out of them, out of some raft boards, and uh, trellis them up with some. Uh, uh, nice and good and then uh, set that out on an anchor out in the pond uh, and uh, we'll see how that goes and be kind of a fun little experiment I, I plenty of people have asked me about that and uh, you know can I just put an nft board on my pond so you know what we're gonna take some some six or seven foot plants and we're gonna trellis them and set them out over the pond and we're gonna see what happens and make sure they have a good four feet of air above the water you know so that there's nothing that's can touch down or get moldy or anything and uh, so they can breathe well and then uh, and then we'll see how that goes so that'll be fun um, we we have our our one acre pond that pumps into the five acres of the backyard we're uh, in the process of finalizing all the the chemistry dosing on that i'm waiting on my latest lab report from the water from the pond uh, along with the uh, we've, we've done a couple different months where we've done well testing so i'm just trying to make sure that our well water isn't changing all that much now that we're coming into a little bit of a dry season uh, uh, a lot of times your well water can change dramatically over the course of the year. And if it's your first year or two growing on a property, you should be testing that well water one, once a month or every other month uh, to make sure you're not getting any curveballs. I've seen pH change as much as a point and a half uh, within a couple of days, uh, particularly in Colorado when they switch reservoirs, when they take water uh, and some other places like that. You can have radical changes in water chemistry in your tap water. So just because your your tap water is a certain, a certain way, um, uh, you know, at a certain time of year doesn't mean that it's going to be um, that way all the time. So don't take it for granted that your pH is always a certain thing in, in, in your water source. Uh, it might not always be that way. Um, so, um, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, uh, something else to think about. So we've been working on that, uh, getting the, the fields amended, getting everything plowed up in between raindrops, trying to get the irrigation manifolds in so we can get that all plugged in. Uh, putting in new HEPA filtration on all the uh, buildings. Uh, we're upgrading what we had there. We had pretty good filtration before. Uh, we managed to get a hold of some pretty good equi used equipment uh, or basically new equipment to, to get that up and running. So that'll be awesome. Um, so uh, looking to just upgrade a lot of our, our stuff here and get you know more efficiency, more, more volume out of what we already have. Um, that's often the, the best place to start when you're working with the with the grow is uh, okay look we can squeeze quite a bit more out of this if we just do spend a little bit of money here and there and then often uh, can make some big differences so that'll be really good and uh, help make uh, especially with the temperature cutting up uh, in the middle of summer is going to help uh, make life a little bit easier in there uh, uh, whereas in the winter time it wasn't so much of an issue um, so that'll be great and um, uh, what else are we doing just trying to uh, getting ready to replumb the greenhouse. We'll, we'll have a lot more information on that later on. Um, we have a rescue kitten uh, that is very cute uh, that uh, we found, or the boss found uh, uh, in front of a store the other day, and uh, she's recovered quite well. Uh, and uh, so that's been also uh, going on. And then. Um, Popping some seeds. We have some seeds, uh, seed production going. So we're crossing Sunset Mac and Orange Cookies Mac with um, uh, some Alaskan Purple and then also with some cheese. And then we're also crossing, we have another, what's the other female that we have in there? Uh, I don't remember. I think it's a Bubba Kush. 
chem dog. It's a chem dog. Um, so we'll have okay. some some Mac chem dog crosses. So I'm I'm real stoked on that and seeing what the smell profile or the terpene profile comes out because both of those uh, are just loud. The in the flower room are just loud as fuck. So uh, that'll be really cool. Super stoked to see the seeds on that and. Uh, uh, who knows maybe we'll even kick a few of those out to the community um that'd be nice yeah, uh, yeah. um uh, other than that just trying to get everything geared up for the outdoor uh, we're hiring some more people on uh, and getting them trained up to be ready to work on the outdoor so that's you know its own stuff and then uh um just trying to get make sure we have fourteen thousand healthy plants on hand to go outside along with uh what we need for our normal flowering room and then uh whatever you know we have a few other projects that we can we need f plants too so we're basically you know i go in and uh make sure all the cloning stuff is going well inspect for insects make sure we don't have anything that we need to do for for pest management and um and go from there and that's something else that uh we've been doing is transitioning over i don't know if anyone else out there has been doing this as well but uh, transitioning uh, especially in the south if, if you're in oklahoma uh, your your beneficial insects over to more heat tolerant species now that the weather is, is patterns have changed into the 90s regularly, um, you know switching over your your main, your primary predators uh, to ones that can tolerate that you know getting away from persimilis and switching to Californicus and uh, you know uh, maybe even adding assassin bugs uh, as a, a, a over aureus aureus don't particularly deal with the heat quite as well uh, as some of the others so uh, as regular assassin bugs can be really good. Uh, and then um, uh, the uh, punctinius, the, the uh, spider mite uh, uh, ladybird actually, or they call them spider mite destroyers, actually are really good for aphids and um, uh, quite a wide range of things, a little bit on white fly and then, um, you know, of course, your spider mites, uh, as well as some of your other mite species. So they can be a great thing. And again, all of those guys can tolerate 100, 105 degrees Fahrenheit um, and are, uh, you know, uh, kind of your your generalist package when you when you have to handle the fact that the greenhouse might get a little bit hotter than you actually anticipate uh you know if you get a particularly hot day or you know if it's a hundred and 115 or 112 outside it's even with a wet wall it's still going to be 100 inside right so i still need i need insects that aren't going to croak on me when, it, when that happens and uh, lace wings don't do particularly good uh, at those temperatures uh, and some of your predator mites don't do particularly good at those uh, those upper end temperatures. So, um, you know, making sure that uh, you, you adapt that uh, your your IPM with your predator bugs, and you're getting your appropriate temperature predator bugs. Californicus is going to be one of your best predatory mites uh, for for those brutally high temperatures for the midsummer because they can tolerate you know those 90 plus degree temperatures just fine, uh, whereas most of your other predator might start to have serious issues especially with life cycle issues when you get up to those higher temperatures so so uh let's see you, what did you just say I, I had a question i've had about four questions but you you know you covered a great deal of information um oh shit um just recently you oh you're talking about 105 degrees Oh, so I, oh, my question was, well, are you using anything like a 70% shade cloth and, and such like that to cut down on the temperatures in the greenhouse? The, uh, the side that, now you're in a dry environment, so that yeah, wet wall is yeah, great yeah. in a greenhouse, but you also need shade cloth, so are you using that? We have a 40% shade cloth that we can pull across that actually cuts off the, I mean, it, it cuts the temperature down significantly um, with an attic, you know, with extra attic fans that we, we, when that closes, those turn on as well to help move that air a little bit faster. Um, and it uh, really, really helps significantly. So um, and something all on the outside? Pretty much required, um, in, in my opinion. But uh, I would also, you know, if I was doing new construction, particularly in warm climate or really anywhere, uh, warm or cold, I would absolutely go with... Um, uh, geothermal you know if you're in a cold climate you're going to start off at uh, 68 degrees or 58 degrees and go up from there if you're in a, a oklahoma or texas or or whatever you know you're going to get maybe 60 degrees uh, underground maybe a few degrees warmer but you're you know that's still cold air you know compared to what it is outside you put a tiny little fan on that 
and uh, suddenly a little solar fan and suddenly you're getting you know a, a huge supply of cold air out of the ground uh, which uh, for greenhouses can be a great way to supplement without having to rely on, on a, air conditioning which you know gets very expensive um, right. but you can stack that and, and we're actually that's another big project we're going to be doing here certainly is putting in some ground coils to get the water temperature down our water temperature starting to creep up uh, we're about 74.5 right now which is getting a little bit warmer than I'd like for the cannabis. So uh, we're, we're not there yet, but we're get, we're definitely on the upper end of, of the safe range. So um, we're going to get a bunch of PEX line and, and we'll do some videos and stuff on this where we, we run the coils through the beds uh, and then out, run that yep. out to a heat exchanger in the ground that is buried, you know, a few feet underground um, uh, what, that also have more coils that bleed the, the heat back off. And then this way we can bleed off a, a huge amount of uh, water temperature that way per hour uh, using next to no energy. Um, you know, just a little recirculatory pump as long as you have an expansion tank in there in case it gets hot or cold, we don't have any problems with the lines blowing. Um, uh, it, it's pretty simple. Um, so uh, yeah, do we have any questions from chat? If you have any questions you're watching live, feel free to ask them in chat and we'll get them, Roger, Roger and I will take a stab at it. Um, I have one plant, what's the cheapest way to get rid of spider mites? The cheapest plant, oh, you <laughs> we, have one We just plant. agree on this, so okay. <laughs> so if you have one plant and it's in veg and it's little and you're gonna veg it for a while, dip it and stuff, take it, bare root it, dip it in subfoil X, and you'll kill everything on it, okay? Uh, if you have one plant and you don't want to do that, you could get, I mean, it'd be slightly overkill, but it'd be comically overkill. You could get one little packet of Persimilis from like, the, the cheapest ones, sorry. The cheapest mm -hmm. ones you can buy are in the 30, 30 or $40 range. Um, uh, and, uh, and go from there, so. Um, uh yeah so again uh, that would be probably my go-to i really like persimilis they're specifically uh predators to two spotted spider mites the other one would be the pectonic pectinium uh the spider mite destroyer ladybug ladybird um both of those although they're more expensive um the persimilis is going to be significantly cheaper um, but that would be you know if you want to guarantee that you can knock it out I, that would be what i would do again a little bit overkill for one plant but <coughs> it'll work right it'll definitely work yeah, that's what I was thinking too. That's a little expensive for one plant. Yeah, you know, but basically that I guess is it a good idea. Just depends on uh, how much you want that one plant to survive, and uh, yeah. if you're in a less than legal or in a legal area. Um, uh, I'm hunting a pack of alien cookie F2s from Jaws to see if I can't pull that mother of the Mac one. Mm, chem dog favorite cultivar. What else? Uh, you have any other questions? You have you guys? Heard of agrovoltaics? Uh, I have not. Uh, using solar panels over cover crops to, or over crops. Sorry, using solar panels over crops. The crops help efficiency of panel. Oh yeah, so you're talking about the solar powered um, uh, greenhouse panels. So the issue you have with those is some of the light reduction on them is kind of extreme, depending on maybe for cannabis, it would be a bit much, but for lettuce, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be a big deal. Um, and that would be a, a good one to, uh, uh, to use. I've seen them before and uh, I know that they have definitely are, are uh, evolved significantly since the older models that I have seen in person. Um, Generally, though, at least for cannabis, I would say that they're not, they, they reduce light transfer too much. But again, that they may have come a long way uh, since the last version that I've looked at. Uh, did I bring any genetics back from South Africa? Um, <laughs> no, no. You know, he brought some genetics back from, allegedly. <laughs> um, I'm not sure on that one. Um, exciting tech. Uh, okay. What are your plans for controlling grasshoppers outdoors? So I have two things that I really like for grasshoppers outdoors. Uh, the first off one, if you want a commercially available one that you can actually, you know, get signed off on, you know, through a certification board and a lot of times, um, 
is a uh, uh, Nolo bait. No, um, it's a product called Nolo bait, and that one's really good uh, for for grasshoppers in particular. And then the other one that um, uh, I've liked, well, uh, you know, assassin bugs, aureus, uh, all of your larger general predators. Um, uh, uh, or praying mantises but the thing that i found that worked really well in africa was doing uh and I, you know what at this point i i need to just do a, a a video on it so maybe maybe in the next week we'll just we'll go grab some uh, i just need to get some insect frass and we'll just do it maybe we can even do it the next trip to town um, but uh, doing an insect frass imo uh, and then doing an, a, a collection of bacteria that actually feed on insect skeletons and then taking that, turning that into a, a liquid IMO uh, and then doing that as a foliar spray and, and then doing it as an application, not only on my plants in the outdoor, but also on the ground and the, and the, the other plants on the area immediately surrounding the plants, uh, you know, and, and the, you know, the borders of the fields. Uh, and that is really, um, what I have found uh, to be the the best uh, um, uh, overall the best co most cost effective way um, you know you you take uh, so for example you you do your traditional IMO collection so you take a, a cedar box or I've seen some really interesting results with cardboard lately um, with, with some people experimenting but uh, you take a cedar box or a basket or whatever you're you're going to use for your your breathable um, uh, material. Uh, you're going to take rice uh, and then mix it one third uh, of the volume with uh, insect frass to two thirds of the volume with rice or other starch, uh, depending on what your locally available starch is for your IMO collection. Uh, and then you're going to steam that until it's 80 to 85% on the way done. As Chris Trump likes to say, el dente pasta done. Um, and then take that uh, and put that into your uh, IMO basket, place uh, over the top, um, uh, your, uh, uh, on top of it, put your paper towel or whatever you're going to use for your top covering, uh, and then put your different, you know, um, mycelium or whatever your other, your, your other collection that's going to drop the spores through on top of that, place that out into your forested area, uh, the same way you would a traditional IMO collection collect your IMO, come back, turn that into IMO2, um, turn that into liquid IMO, uh, following those traditional methods, um, you know, cutting the volume by 50% with sugar, uh, maybe 52%, 53% actually is a little bit better for, for long-term storage. Um, uh, you know, a little bit better than 55, or 50, 50 rather. Uh, so, um, and then using that uh, as a, a source for when you do your teas. So you can take that, brew it up uh, as you would for liquid IMO, uh, and then use that as directly as a foliar spray. And again, that was by far the most cost effective way. We were in the middle of nowhere. We couldn't go buy a bunch of Nolo bait. I couldn't get a bunch of probiotics. I couldn't get a bunch of predator bugs. I could get predator bugs, but I could get them from South Africa. And sometimes they came, sometimes they didn't, sometimes they came alive, sometimes they didn't. So, um, you know, I, I kind of just had to rely on those types of things there. And um, that really is, you know, we did a couple of tests with IMO, putting the insect frass in an IMO one collection stage versus IMO three and to a liquid IMO. Uh, and then um, we did it with the insect frass with no insect frass mixed in with the to uh, IMO two, uh, and then IMO th uh, adding the insect frass and then making IMO three, uh, and then. Oh really? Okay. Um, okay. Uh, so we did a couple of different combos, and we found that by far the best one was putting the insect frass at the point of collection. And, and if you think about it, you know, providing that food source there at the point of collection with the starch, of course that makes sense. That um, uh, you know uh, they're going to. Um, uh, end up with more microbes that are immediately bioactive if you're actually collecting those chitin feeding microbes uh, directly from your local environment. And then you also don't have to worry about introducing path you know, potentially uh, pathogenic microbes that aren't from your local environment that might have a negative impact on local insect species because you're just cultivating the ones that are already there. 
Um, so you don't have to worry about negatively impacting your local environment in a way that might be, um, uh, uh, you know, hurt or harm your uh, local butterflies or pollinators or whatever uh, in a way that they're not used to already. So. And keep in mind that when Steve went from IMO 1 and 2 and he was explaining this, IMO 2 is merely you take the, the rice and the hypo that you've collect, that have grown after you're you place it in the forest to make sure you cover it too, so it doesn't get rained on or anything can get into it. I mean, just for you, uh, uh, more be, you know, not beginners, but you know, if you're not sure. Uh, but you 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 mix when you do IMO two. It's merely like doing an FPJ. You're mixing an equal amount of brown sugar with the hypa and the rice uh, in order to make IMO two. And then you cover it with your breathable cloth and, you know, and process that way. Yep, absolutely. Um, let me see here. Back up to the chat and scroll down for a bit. Um, what are your plans? Oh, so uh, hopefully that answers your question for controlling grasshoppers. I would say that <laughs> yeah, the, no the yeah. harder issue was um, uh, last year was just dealing with uh, the mainly caterpillars, the tent worms, uh, and just keeping them at bay. Mainly just through hand picking, frankly, just going through and <laughs> oh, there's one, picking them off. And that was it. That's you know, the old there really was. We, we released Trichogamma. We also did BTI. I, I'll be frank with you. Based on my experience last year in Oklahoma, BTI is useless uh, for for cannabis application, at least. Um, it, it seemed to have absolutely no effect on the caterpillar numbers. Um, the aureus, aureus seemed to have a pretty good effect on them. Uh, when we did aureus releases, we had a noticeable reduction in the tenting uh, or in finding any of the, you know, the, the, the leaves that go from this to being all curled up on themselves or whatever when they they ball up to make their little cocoon um, to protect themselves uh, the aureus seemed to make quite a big impact on them last year at least on the on the half acre that we did in uh, up north um, cornell university is interested in, what size pipes do you recommend for geothermal hvac and greenhouses uh, I recommend if you have for your your central manifolds I wouldn't do anything smaller than a than a 55 gallon drum uh, for your main manifolds and then for your, your interconnectors, I would do three inch or four inch. Um, uh, cost wise, it's pretty cheap to do both either one. What PPFD should you shoot for in greenhouses, veg and flower? I don't remember the PPFD exact numbers off the top of my head. I have it all written down. I just don't remember. Um, I'll see if I can dig it up for the end of the show. Is there a general equation for fish plant size and the amount of water? How do I decide a total gallons the amount of fish? Does it equate to the amount of lights or plants? Are we talking indoor system? So I have a bunch of this stuff in my book that's coming out. Um, a lot of the stuff I have pretty far along. Um, I think we'll wait until the book comes out to do some of that exact stuff. But uh, in general, um, it takes about a gallon per 1.1 square feet of, of canopy space um, in terms of system size um, and, and uh, uh, fish tank, I'm sorry, not system size, fish tank size. So you're looking between 0.8 to 1.1 gallons uh, of fish tanks uh, per uh, square foot of canopy space in your greenhouse bay. Um, uh, so. Uh, and that really depends on fish species. So if you're doing uh, koi, goldfish, or tilapia, um, you know, you're looking at you know, maybe closer to that 0 0.7, 0 0.8 uh, gallons. If you're going to do something a little more sensitive um, uh, and on a large scale decoupled or something like that, like they do up at a habitat, you're looking at, you know, maybe closer to something, uh, maybe a 1.1, 1.2, maybe even a 1.4. Um, because they need that extra water volume for those fish species. So again, it's really going to heavily depend on the fish species in particular uh, that you're growing. Um, but in general, 0 0.7, 0 0.8 to, to one gallon uh, of flower of of uh, fish tank space uh, to uh, canopy space. 
Yeah, so the book, we're going to have a whole bunch of charts and sizing stuff. Uh, I, it's called um, uh, Aquaponacea. Uh, I have been working on it pretty extensive, extensively. Um, I actually kind of, uh, I was doing really good progress and not getting off on any side tangents. And then I got down this rabbit hole of um, people keep asking me, uh, okay, well, what do I want to do if I were want to replace my baby bottles? What do I want to do if I want to have no mineral inputs at all uh, uh, whatsoever? Um, what, how could I do something like that? And the answer uh, is not fish poop has all everything in it. Uh, and, you know, I have some magical mineralization thing that uh, has a, uh, 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 what do they call them? A philosopher's stone that converts, you know, lead to gold and uh, uh, fish poop into molybdenum and other trace minerals that they're incapable of turning into. Um, we actually use uh, plant inputs and ferment them and uh, do other types of um, uh, mainly Korean natural or natural farming type uh, mineralization processes uh, in order to provide heavy amounts of them uh, and then documenting those and then making ensuring that they're all fish safe uh, has been the new rabbit hole that I've been doing. So um, that's going to be uh, included in that as well so that, uh, you know, hey, if you want to really go the, uh, the super hardcore hippie direction of it, um, um, we can, uh, you know, you'll have your options as to how to how to go around that and, and how to go in that direction. And hey, if you just want to run a commercial system and have a pretty good, uh, uh, maybe not run a commercial system off of the book, but you'll have a pretty damn good idea on, on exact dosing if you just want to uh, pump pump yield and pump cash out and make it run smoothly and not have to really fussle with it. Um, uh, someone you, said in can chat, I ask I said, you something real quick? Yeah. It's the first time I've heard you say anything in regard to relation to fish poop created molybdenum, I thought I just heard you say. It so doesn't. You... It doesn't. I was being oh, sarcastic. it doesn't. Oh, okay. I, no, I said you need a philosopher. No, so there, there's oh, this thing oh, called oh. a philosopher's stone that transfers object uh, any any mineral into any other mineral it's a it's a made up thing so okay, I was, I was that, oh, sorry okay all right that's i just wanted to say wait a minute that didn't sound right okay so <laughs> if you do need to add a molybdenum to your system a sodium molybdenate is the easiest way to add it to your system uh, uh, at an accurate dose way um as far as the plant-based stuff you're gonna have to buy the book in order to to get those ones and it takes this much <laughs> no uh uh once i uh, uh once i have the every, everything written we'll, we'll do a couple of breakouts a couple of different sections i'm not i'm not just trying to be a dick about hey buy buy it i'm not telling you uh we actually will break it out but uh, uh molybdenum is one of the sections i haven't gotten to yet but uh, i've done most of, most of the minerals except for molybdenum um uh, manganese and copper i think are the three i have left but uh, again, uh, right now, if you guys knew everything on my work plate right now, and I'm still finding at least 20 minutes a day to work on the book, uh, yeah, it's insane. So for the time being. That's um, pretty awesome, though, because it, you know, um, being a far, you know, farming for real day after, you know, there's, there are no days off. And, you know, so you work your ass off all day, like you're getting up at three o'clock in the morning, you get out there to beat the heat. And most farmers do that. And people don't realize that most farmers, uh, they stop working at one o'clock in the afternoon, you know, and they go in till uh, like dinner time or, or, you know, they don't have dinner till maybe eight, because they'll go back out at five or six or seven, and do a little bit of this or that, you know, again, you know, but you beat you get out of there for the hot super in Oklahoma. Holy crap, I can't even imagine how hot. It was so hot today I couldn't see straight. So my eyes were my eyes were sweating, you know. But sorry, I just wanted to give you kudos, Steve, for that, you know. About yeah, I know, yeah. Work there's no days off when you farm. If you want to become a farmer, the weed industry is kind of a psychotic time. So it's <laughs> you better be ready to be committed. That's all. If you're not committed, you're not gonna succeed. And we, we, you know, the rains, we had a, a good solid week of rain down here. So it, it kind of pushed us back schedule wise because you can't, anyone that knows you can't drive a tractor if it's a, a mud pit out there. So you'll just trench it out and then you'll, you'll be all pissed off. So can't do that. 
Um, so he said, Steve says uh, nettle is better than horsetail for silica source ferment. Absolutely. So, so the thiamine, there's a couple of reasons for this. So one, so, uh, silica has a lot of, uh, horsetail contains yeah. a lot of silica. The problem is that silica is very unavailable compared to, uh, because of the way that it's bound up uh, in, the, in the horsetail compared to how it's bound up in the, the stinging nettle. Stinging nettle actually is, uh, uh, over four times the amount of silica in it, uh, just as a baseline, uh, than, than horsetail does. Uh, horsetail also contains a chemical called thiamine, which actually reduces vitamin B uptake. Or maybe a mis it might not be thiamine, I, I might be mispronouncing that. Uh, uh, but uh, it has a, a component that actually, if you take it in too large quantities, will kill you. But it actually reduces um, the ability to absorb vitamin B. Now, vitamin B is needed to, for growth acceleration. In fact, we talk about um, making labs with, with, with kefir over traditional Arab-collected labs for the uh, reason that you get the additional vitamin B complexes over even with still doing lactobacillus, you get significantly wider ranges of vitamin B complexes, which means your plants grow faster and they're healthier. Uh, so by using the horsetail, you're actually inhibiting some of that uh, benefit if you're using that in conjunction or just reducing your plants vitamin B utilization and efficiency in general. So uh, why horsetail traditionally has been good. And even before I researched this book, I thought it was awesome. Uh, now that I've actually had a chance to really dig through it a little bit more and learn more about it, um, this has just been one of the rabbit holes that really kind of opened me up to, to changing the way I think about a lot of tradition, the way a lot of traditionally thought of natural inputs are. I think a lot of this stuff actually is, is, is wrong. Uh, and, and it's not that uh, there isn't a replacement immediately that you guys also have in your yard. Uh, we just need to uh, point out that there's other sources that you have on your property that might actually be a much better source of these different minerals. Uh, and that if you combine them with some of the natural farming techniques, such as labs and FPJ and FFJ and some of those other stuff and, and advanced IMO collections like we talked about with the, with the insect collection stuff with the insect IMO, um, I call IPM IMO. I know it's kind of too many letters, but um, <laughs> well, I want to uh, say something uh, kind of, real quick. But it kind of is the direction I think that a lot of people want to go. They want to have okay. Well, I clearly need calcium. I clearly need iron. They want to have that. Hey, I, I can go buy the bottle solution to their their problem, but they want it in a way that they can utilize in an organic solution. That's where I think that that combining a lot of this and uh, combining with testing for with a lot of this bioaccumulator uh, information and by uh, in terms of tissue data that's put put out there already with a lot of the Korean natural farming methodologies can unlock a whole new way of immediately available um, uh, nutrient solutions for for a whole host of crops not just cannabis but for for people to have that kind of okay cool i need silica i just need to go ferment some some stinging nettle i need iron Okay, well, that's also in the stinging nettle. Uh, cool. So I just cover both of those, uh, you know, or whatever, like, and figuring out ones that actually are in high enough PPMs to be viable, not like banana peels, which you have to have something like 2 million banana peels and then burn <laughs> them all to make them useful in a 100 gallon system, right? Like to actually have enough potassium in terms of physical volume. So, so, you know, whereas some of this other stuff actually has super high concentrated levels of these nutrients that if they're fermented or otherwise unlocked and made more bioavailable can actually be an enormous bioavailable source in a way that's kind of in that shelf ready way that we're kind of used to thinking of in mineral salts uh, uh, in terms of being able to pick and choose and min max. Well, what I wanted to say about the indigenous, it's all about, like he said, on your land, how it's about harvesting things from your property or your area, immediate area where the you've got the same environment, you've got the same types of soil, your terroir and all that. It's about when you when you want to make fermented plant juice, you just walk out if you've got property. All right. Some of us have a yard. You don't have property. But if you have property, you walk out there and you walk, look at these big giant, what you would call a weed, you know, like even dandelions or something. But then like now Steve brought up a good point about, you know, he was looking for uh, for fermented 
uh, or for plants that had silica in it at the beginning of the conversation. And, and that's real important. But the, the idea of for the permitted plant use and so, such like that in the IMO is that you it is indigenous. It, it's all about the fact that it works in your environment. You're not importing it from somewhere. You're making it all in your own backyard or your forests that you can get to in your immediate area. And that's where you might go look, you like your mycelium. The mycelium that lives in your yard will do better in your yard than it would if I send it to Steve in Oklahoma. Because the mycelium Steve has to find in Oklahoma is indigenous to that dry climate with low humidity, where I'm in a, swampy climate with high humidity so you know it not saying it wouldn't you know like help or or, or it creates something interesting because <laughs> we're starting to find out i mean we're opening up a, a th th several thousand year old uh science you know so to speak and then putting our modern ideas to it you know we've got great teachers out there doing it for us so yeah i just want to throw that in there Absolutely, yeah. Um, we had uh, another question. I got some pure kush from a dispensary in Oklahoma City. The flower is good, but it has a seed in it. Would I be able to grow that seed or no? Um, yeah, you could absolutely grow yeah. that seed. Um, you don't know if it's a hermaphrodite seed or a, a, a true seed or not, but uh, more than likely, it's probably a herm seed, and depending on where you got it. But uh, uh, most of those are are or that way, yeah. Um, when you get random seeds, nine times out of ten, it's a hermaphrodite seed. Uh, uh, when you get them from a dispenser, usually. Um, yeah, if there's only one in the whole thing, it was top yeah. Shelf, That's not true. cheap. Uh, absolutely. Um, let me see what else. Uh, oh, but plant it. Well, Steve's looking. Plant it. Get your solo cup and throw some potting mix, pro mix, or something like in there, and sprout it. You never know. You never know. So uh, someone asked what the molybdenum source is. We touched on that. Sodium molybdenate is going to be your go-to for that. You can get that through trueaquaponics.com. Uh, for anyone, one second, sorry about that. Um, <laughs> Got to let the dogs in and out sometimes. Um, uh, for anyone that's uh, interested and needs nutrients for aquaponics, especially aquaponic cannabis, be sure to check out trueaquaponics.com. Uh, we also have I, that's a run by a friend of mine named uh, Roger, uh, uh, a different Roger than this one. Um, and then uh, we also have a subscription service that I run with Roger, uh, where we provide testing services as well as nutrient dosing and uh, mineral solutions for uh, aquaponic systems. So we will test your water for you, uh, dose the system for you to adjust your nutrients into the proper range based on your crop temperature and location. Uh, as well as pest pressure uh, to maximize uh, efficiencies in all of those areas, uh, as well as uh, provide you with those minerals in a tear open, easy to use package. So you just send in your water sample and you get a package, you rip it open, it has a date on it, you rip it open on the date, pour it into your sump and it's fish safe, counts for all the chemistry uh, and everything you need. You can check that out over at trueaquaponics.com or hey, if you already know what you're doing, you just need to get a, a fish safe mineral that's already been sourced in, in a way that we know is, is good quality. Um, be sure to, to just to check that out over at True Aquaponics uh, if you are in need of those types of minerals. Cool. That sounds like one of my ideas. Yeah. <laughs> um, so if you have hard tap water, can I and the in theory run it through RO and then back to a fraction of tap water to get back some of the minerals? You could do that. You could also put like aragonite in the bottom of your RO tank. Uh, and you could also separately, depending on what it is exactly that you need to strip out of the water, you could use a, what is called a cold sterile, which is kind of like a, um, a lighter version of an RO unit. Um, again, it, it really depends on what it is you're trying to clean up out of that water. Are you just trying to take some of the pH off? Are you trying to strip or do you live near a fracking well and you're trying to get some pretty yeah. hardcore oh, stuff? Um, you know, that... I, I've seen people that were next to fracking wells that would burn through RO things in about a month and a half and they would just like melt. So, um, you know, it really just depends on what, 
how much you have to clean up that, that water. So, you know, based on the, what the, what the pre inputs are and the total, what the TDS was and the total PPMs were going into that. And then what exactly that was would make a huge difference. Um, uh, and I feel sad for you if you feel, if you're near a fracking field because you're screwed. So. You'd have to buy a $4,000 RO unit, basically. You could do it, but it would be a $4,000 unit. As if you were living on an island surrounded by salt water, you would, it would cost you four to $5,000 to a RO unit that would uh, so take care of water like that. Someone else in chat brought up, and I forgot about this. They have those remineralization cartridges too that are just for that. Oh yeah, you just replace the cartridges over and over and over too. That's the other thing with RO units. You can buy RO units that are you know you very can... affordable from eighty to two hundred bucks. You just have to keep yeah. up with the filters because they wear out fast. If you're in, if you got bad water, they wear out fast. So you just have to buy cases of the cartridges that you replace because most of them are. Just you unscrew it and replace the, the filter. And it just depends too what you're using for your RO. Um, your RO water, uh, you know, are you, if you're just doing aquaponics, you, you generally don't need RO water unless your input water source is either A, really high in pH or sodium, or B, really high in some, some heavy metal or something like that. Um, it's Good not point. too often. I mean, if you don't out, don't have those things, you generally don't need to, to RO it. Um, you know, maybe just a carbon filter to pull off your car, your chlorine or chloramine, and, and you're good to go. Uh, I know quite a few aquaponic farms just do large carbon filters. Yeah, because the whole point is we're trying to stay as natural as possible and allow the natural minerals to be allowed. You know, instead of it would, when you RO, you end up with nothing, you know, like 0 0.003. Oh, that's funny. That's like the hemp thing almost. Like, oh my God, don't get me started. Um, but you, you, you break down the water where you have to resupply every mineral back to the water. Of course, if you have the fish, you've got those minerals to go. And then you would have to continue to supplement uh, with the different like uh, phosphate and, and, and other things. Uh, that you would have to do aside from the top zone, they would supplement in the dual root zone. But yes, yeah. Different spin. All right. Uh, this is uh, well, the well water is main, mainly 302 ppm TDS. So that's not too bad. It's hard um, water, though, double two time hard water. Again, it depends on what the pH is. Right, but hard water, uh, salt water, hard water is at, uh, cut off at 150 and uh, 300. I got 220. I got 200 to 220, and I've been running a farm for, you well, know. But I would imagine that at 302, the pH is probably pretty high. Yeah, and it's probably, well, I, you know what? It, well, the thing is, is what's in there? Is it, is it uh, iron? Yeah. Because iron yeah. a lot is is a main, you know, there's, that's Usually a lot. Usually when it's not high, it's calcium. Oh, pH is 8.8 to 9.2. There oh, you go. Wow. Yeah, you definitely need, you you most definitely need an RO. Yeah. <laughs> or yeah. you need a pre-tank where you could flash it with carbonic acid or or something like that. That would like be a cheap water treat a miniature to. water treatment plant. Yeah. Yeah, just flash it with CO2 or throw a brick of dry ice in it or something. Um, so I got seven just for y'all know whether we're in the car. I got my water seven to neutral to seven point two. So I'm pretty damn lucky at two hundred to two twenty and seven to seven point two. So I'm spoiled, I guess you would say. But good well, you could drink it if you you know life depended on it, you know. <laughs> this right. is really cool, Steve. So, I mean you could be cool. Uh, something about fluoride. I haven't seen much in the way of fluoride. We did a lot of testing with fluoride um, back for a little bit when I was an aquaponic source. And the only thing that ever seemed to bioaccumulate bio fluoride in any considerable levels in tissue sampling from the water was brassicas. 
Um, brassicas, hands down, will absolutely bioaccumulate fluoride to, to a point where you can detect, you know, noticeably detect it uh, in the leaf tissue itself. But that was the only one. And so if you were worried about fluoride in your water, you absolutely, uh, and, and we're running a closed loop like an aquaponics system, you could absolutely um, put brassicas, you know, kale, broccoli, collard greens, um, those types of things uh, to suck it up and, and export it. Oh, nice. Uh, Can you smell it? Other questions we have here. Don't have bug pressure. Is silica needed? So silica is needed for a few reasons. That's a great question. Yeah. So silica activates a, a specific. So, so there's a minimum threshold needed to activate immune system response genes that um, will, uh, 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 if it's above a certain threshold, it wakes up these genes. And those genes will increase terpene expression. They're, they help with mold resistance and with UV resistance and with um, general insect resistance. It makes their cell walls a little stronger. Uh, so you'll have a stronger plant. They'll also have a, a, a better trichome. There, there's evidence for increased trichome density uh, as well as um, uh, uh, better, a huge re uh, re increase in heat resistance and heat stress response, as well as cold stress response. Uh, we've noticed a big increase in uh, frost resistance in, in quite a wide range of crops, not just cannabis, but lettuce and other leafy greens as well uh, with, with, with silica levels versus uh, non-silica levels. So um, uh, there's a whole wide range of, of reasons why you should be adding silica nudge just for both. Sorry, I've been awake for many hours today working in the heat. Um, fuck, I can't even think. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you were doing well. You're talking about silica. silica and as yeah. usual, so, so it silica isn't just for mold and insects. It's also for um, those things as well, for, for just overall plant health and yield. And uh, again, to prevent breaking during, during flower. The strength it provides to the plant is, it, it equates to um, being resistant to disease and you know other things, and even I think even, even might emit some kind of terpene that I think and maybe you know I might be off on this, but that might uh, repel certain pests. Yeah, so terpenes are a result of our immune system response, and we've talked about this in aquaponics before about how particularly dual root zones allow for you to have more types of different species of beneficial non-pathogenic microbial species interacting with that root zone. And by having the maximum number of non-pathogenic microbes exposed to the root system, you actually can get the maximum amount of stimulation on the plant's immune system. It's like giving it the most vaccines possible and really overstimulating and hyperstimulating the immune system of that plant. So it's making a ton of antibodies. Well, the plant's a version of antibodies would be terpene production uh, is trying to prevent you know create essential oils and essential co oil compounds and and flavonoids and terpenoids and um cannabinoids and you know um carotenoids and you, know, you get all the different classified classifications of your different terpene groups or whatever um, um but you know, in order to defend itself from mold or from UV or from frost or from insects or from or from caterpillars, I know in hops certain certain types of hops or certain hop trichomes actually when they eat when a caterpillar eats them, the caterpillar now its its uh, pheromones that it emits actually now uh, change slightly and now attract predatory wasps. So, uh, and, and, and increase the, the chance that those predatory wasps will find that predatory insect. So some of these interactions are incredibly complex when it comes to the, the, the chemistry on that. I mean, it's how some of this shit even came to be is, is nothing short of incredible. Um, Zenthanol talks a whole lot about this. He's got a, a really cool like two hour video on the evolutionary history of cannabis and its pathogens and insects uh, uh, that, that attack it. And it talks about the different things that attack cannabis and their evolutionary history uh, compared to the cannabis's evolutionary history. And it's really interesting. 
uh, if you ever really want to try and wrap your head around a little bit more of some of these incredibly complex interactions. But uh, we don't even understand a tenth of the different things that are going on, better yet, <laughs> anything beyond that. So it's something really to think about when you're going into that. But this is why, again, simply stimulating the immune system response of the plant in as many ways as possible, um, <coughs> that really is the, the best way to go. Uh, if you're trying to increase and that could be living soil and trying to do it that way or it could be aquaponics you know but both of them are basically trying to achieve the same goal which is getting the maximum number of of non-pathogenic beneficial microbes or even non it doesn't even necessarily be beneficial just non-pathogenic microbes exposed to that plant's immune system uh, i use we've talked about this before on the show as well with uh, and two great examples of this is putting plants directly in media beds and directly in DWC versus putting them in a dual root zone pot in media beds or in a dual root zone pot in, in DWC. The plants that have the soil layer have a noticeable increased resistance to both powdery mildew, septoria, and fusarium, uh, and as well as botrytis. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, they, they, they simply do not get them, maybe. maybe 10% of the time that, that you would the other ones, or if you see start to get PM in your, in, in the grow, it, it doesn't appear on those plants. Or if it does, it's, it's not spreading all throughout the plant or it's not on the stems, it's just in the leaves. It's, it's never that same kind of um, uh, more rapidly systemic type that you see in the media bed and in the DWC plants um, uh, uh, in pretty much every single setup I've seen. Um, whereas when we switch them immediately over to the D, the, the RAF bed or with the DWC with the with the soil, we don't have those problems anymore. The same thing with weight as well with them toppling over, um, you know, unless you're going to scrog them immediately, uh, you know, you really have to put them in the dual roots and if nothing else, just they got something to anchor to and hold themselves up. <laughs> That's definitely true, yeah, because that's a much bigger net pot than what people use in hydroponics. And but the other, it's just the bottom line is with the dual root zone, with that soil layer, it the I what sold me was the idea that I could implement or supplement. I mean, I meant supplement the minerals, uh, you know, what the plant needed as I deemed necessary. You know, and that's what really sold me. It was like a you're creating this really awesome controlled environment that's flowing all the time, you know, and it's extremely natural. And the implements that are, that are you know, the supplements we're adding are, we're using the natural farming methods, right? We're making labs, we're making FPJs and, and FFJs and F FAAs and, you know the cow. You know whatever we're making, and so whenever we find we have a we have a um, um, in it, a situation where we need to to um, uh, what was I trying to say? Uh, uh, oh damn, um, a deficiency. When we have a deficiency, we can easily you know adjust it that way, and that's what I found you know awe inspiring about the dual root zone, and my personally, and. Uh, I think there's uh, that that's something that's going to grow. I think there's still ways that we can even make it better than it is now. And you know, I know I'm sure Steve's got something he's work, you know, figuring out. Or you're not. You're, I I'm certainly trying to figure out a couple different ways to do it a little different and see if it works. Um, Steve, aren't you trying to maybe evolve uh, your current design, or, or are you just? Are you well, no, I'm pretty happy with the, my overall design. So you're happy with that five gallon design, okay? Are you mean with the pots? You mean, or? Well, I'm just saying. All right, what you know, like I somebody brought up on, on the so show. For, for dual like, roots, uh, for dual roots, and we'll do everywhere from three gallon to seven gallon, depending on the the grow term of the plant. If it's DWC, like right now, it, what we're doing here, and we're just doing moms, we just have those in three gallons, and the bottoms are cut out of them with a, a double folded layer of burlap at the bottom and and away they go. Oh, cool. Oh, that's something you brought up the uh, D DWC again. There was something where that was one of the other uh, things I wanted to talk about earlier. Well, and actually you touched on it, but for years and years and years, I started out hydroponics, okay? 
and I still do some hydroponics, but we're converting. So, because uh, I'm not going to lie to you. All right. So the thing is, we always wondered about you to try to, oh, can I grow a pot plant on a raft? Steve brought that up earlier and I didn't want to interrupt him. So I let it go on until I, I remembered now. But the interesting thing about that was Steve saying you have to have some support. So it's just like the way I grow in my greenhouse with vertical support where I string it up to a wire eight to 10 feet tall. It's the same thing. Yeah. So that would be a pretty interesting situation to grow something in a raft in a deep water culture pond where, but you would have to support it vertically, you know, and the fact, and you brought that up. That's the first time I heard you mention, but then again, you've had a few months playing with a deep water culture to raft, you know, uh, system. So I, I love that that you came up with that because, you know, I always thought about that. The only way you could do it, you have to support it because the plant's too heavy. The raft system's really meant for lettuce or, you know, any kind of herbs or anything leafy green that doesn't require really require a flowering period um, and grow smaller. But I mean, you can get two foot tall romaine lettuce in a raft in, in, in uh, you know, 45 to 60 days. Anyway, I just wanted to say that I thought that was cool. You brought that up where you were talking about it because somebody had asked you and you had to support it from above because that's what you have to do. You'd have to, you have to take the weight off the raft. The raft can't support a full grown, Especially no, 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 no. The rafts can support. So the rafts, the weight of it. Well, that, that was the other problem we had with the net cut pot plants and the DWC rafts is that, okay, so even if they're holding themselves up, right? Once that plant gets to four or five feet tall, especially if you're going to grow them any kind of long term, such a small the physical space. weight of that plant. I mean, the plants have stalks on them that are like, you know, the, the size of a, a, exactly. a, a jar, exactly. right? So they're, they're massive. So simply these, these plants weigh 10, 15 pounds, right? Just, just the weight of the trunk and the water and the leaves and the, and the whole thing. So they, they simply just bust the bottom of the cups out. Like they just literally just snap, like rip the plastic apart. Um, well, that's we what I'm that saying though. If you plant, supported them and strung them up the vertically on wire. Obliterated. And these were in one inch net cups. These were in four inch net cups. I mean, we're talking decent sized net cups. They just blowing them apart after, and that was after a month and a month and a week, month and two weeks of, of growth. So and again, aquaponics, we just get psychotic growth. Um, we had a question in chat. Is it a true vermiculite has beneficial silica? So Vermiculite will have beneficial silica in it. It also might potentially have asbestos uh, and other heavy metals in it that you do not want. So, um, although I don't know if asbestos is a heavy metal, but you certainly don't want uh, heavy metals or asbestos in your um, grow media. So uh, vermiculite is actually banned in a lot of organic culture for, for growing. For that reason, it's banned in many states uh, for, for the addition of um, um, the stuff that gives you mesothelioma that I said earlier that I'm forgetting because I'm tired and I'm high. Um, <laughs> so I would not use vermiculite. <coughs> if you want, if you really have a boner for it, use diatomaceous earth. It's about the only thing it's good for because it's useless for everything else. Um, so yeah, well, actually, actually it's not about, useless for everything uh, else. It'll it'll no, it's, re, it's, it'll get rid of all pet all kind of uh, 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 bugs in your system, system and stuff for your dogs and your yourself and oh, give you yeah. a lot of energy. Good for the, the gut in the gut. You know. Um, so do you add a bit of silica right in your harvest? I actually add silica all the time. Um, if you're doing lettuce and vegetables for aquaponics, you want to maintain a silica level of at least. 60 ppms, uh, ideally a 70 ppm. So you'll have, we've noticed uh, an additional uh, five to seven days shelf life for lettuce and other leafy green products with higher silica levels. Uh, we've also noticed a redu huge reduction in powdery mildew, uh, botrytis, and fusarium, uh, uh, and, and 
uh, better yield and better trichome density compared to controls. So uh, silica, again, makes a huge difference and, and very important. Uh, in cannabis, again, you want to aim for 75 ppms or higher. Um, uh, you know, it really is strain dependent. Some strains will be perfectly fine at 75. Other ones will actually benefit from, from getting closer to 110, 120. Um, again, it really depends on strain. That's awesome you gave uh, the actual PPM because that's the way you do this. If you measure all the minerals, if you were to make your own solution, you would use how many PPMs of each mineral you need. That's something, so so that's something say that a lot 75 of is your benchmark. And then you plus or minus that you can, depending on your strain or cultivar. Sure. Well, that's something a lot of people often get wrong. You know, they think they just need to test their pH and their nitrogen, their ammonia, nitrate, nitrate, and that's it. And uh, a little bit more to it. Um, you should definitely have a HANA iron checker and, uh, uh, you know, HANA, Lamote, Taylor, um, uh, all make really good testing equipment if you're looking yeah. for bigger stuff. Um, we have a really cool multi-tool for, for HANA. Basically, you know, the little HANA checkers, they make one that's like a multi one that'll do like, uh, like 16 different or 14 different minerals or whatever, different types of whatever. Um, so that's pretty cool. So we have one of those, we use that regularly. We can't test for everything, but we can test for more than most people can. Uh, so that's really cool. Um, but if you are looking to test it, again, you can check us out through truealkaponics.com if you want us to manage it for you. Or, uh, you know, you can always send it out if you want to do it yourself to uh, MMI Labs or to um, J.R. Peters based in Allentown, Pennsylvania. Um, both of those guys do that. Or, uh, you know, if you uh, don't want to do that, you can always contact your local ag, ag extension uh, if you wanted to, although sometimes they can be significantly more expensive than the other two options that I listed there for you, or the three options, actually. Uh, I've been quoted as high as $400 for a water test through some of the ag extensions, whereas uh, we definitely don't pay that. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, can you uh, please explain how to incorporate aquaponics into a four by four ebb and flow table with a 50 gallon reservoir? I have six flood and drain tables, do I need a big ass IVC tote? Okay, so if you're just doing a 50 gallon, a four by four flood and drain table to a 50 gallon reservoir, uh, you could do a hang on the back aquarium filter to a 55 gallon aquarium or 40 gallon breeder aquarium and, and you're good to go, right? As long as you keep your reservoir topped off. Um, uh, you don't, really don't have to do much of anything else, just, just plumb it all together. Um, uh, if you're doing six flood and drain tables, yeah, you're going to need an IBC tote. Six flood and drain tables uh, are going to be 50 gallons or 75 gallons. You know, you're going to need to be able to handle. So say you displace that with media, you put hydrogen or lava rock or whatever. It says 50% displacement. Um, so you need to have 25 gallons minimum for every 55 gallon reservoir. And then you want to have an additional 15 to 20% to make sure you don't burn up your pumps. So you're looking at 30 to 35 gallons per reservoir of sump space. Again, you could go on a little bit, you could go a little less than that, right? Because you're stacking them up, but um, that would be roughly what you would need for that. So six times 35 is what? Hold on, I got a calculator open. <laughs> oh, six times 35? That's 210, so you're looking at around, 210? yeah, so, so a 300 gallon IBC tote would do you just fine. I mean, you're, 210 gallons is going to be your 200 to 210 gallons is going to be your minimum for reservoir size for that. And if you got IBC tote, like Steve said, that's the least expense. They are awesome. You know, if you anytime you can pick up one of those, uh -huh. you get a deal, buy it Poly because it's always Poly good to have, you know, extra space, you know. Actually, um, I think True Aquaponics carries tanks now as well. Um, now that I think about it. I'll have to double check with that. I know we were, we were he was going to get that up on the site. I'm going to double check that. If he doesn't, um, definitely go check out Polymart or Polytank. Um, if you're doing a large scale up, uh, you can get them direct. Um, what else do we have on the questions here? Horsetail is an enzyme in it that destroys thiamine, vitamin B1. Thank you for clarifying. Yes, I, I knew I was getting it wrong with the thiamine. It destroys thiamine. Thank you for, for clarifying that. Um, 
uh, I knew I was getting that backwards in some way. Sorry, I'm really tired today and I, my brain's just fried. Hey, hey, you know, there's, a, there's a shitload of information and sometimes mm -hmm. there's so much information that you kind of, you know, you just know the, you know, this is involved with that and sometimes you just miss it. You know, a little bit. <laughs> One second, I'm gonna double check and make sure I'm correct on this. Yeah, okay, I was right. So someone asked in chat what the average lifespan as an arowana is. I thought it was 12 years. Uh, it's actually 10 to 15, so I was dead on. Hey, what? Um, someone asked what the average lifespan of an arowana fish is. Oh, arowana fish, okay. Did you buy that fish because it was almost marijuana fish? You know, I'm just curious. No, arowana actually means water monkey. They're super cool. They're mouth breeders. The babies. If you're if so, if you're looking for probably the single highest end fish that you can raise uh, in conjunction with aquaponic cannabis for profit, uh, the scribble line or squig the squiggle line, uh, the red dragon, uh, any of the the, high, the the platinum, the platinum diamonds, uh, uh, arowanas are going to be the higher end. You know, a lot of those. Oh, cool. Uh, are starting off at two grand a fish. <clears throat> you know, some of them can push forty thousand dollars or ninety thousand dollars a fish. Um, I know the platinums. You know, start off around seventy. So you know, if you're looking for something that you could buy a, a bulk of a whole bunch of fry, raise them out, and then then grade them out and sell them, um, that is going to be a uh, uh, a great way to do that. But of course, if you screw up and kill your fish, you just paid for a bunch of expensive fish that you don't make $40,000 a fish off of. But sorry, sorry, just kind of throw that out there because we used to talk about that. You know, you got to be careful. You know? The light out by our gate. I don't know who it is. Anyways, always <laughs> uh, when you're at a weed farm, always keep it an eye on the place, you know. Um, we stay, I usually end up, uh, the internet connection here is way better than where I stay. So we just finish the show up here before I head back and, uh, yeah, anyways. Um, so what else do we have here in chat for, uh, for questions? Manganese, manganese is important for THC production. Uh, manganese sulfate definitely is one of the better options uh, for it. Um, it's usually what the one I, that I use for that. So I have, again, other 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 stuff out there, but uh, that really is. Well, the how best. would you rate manganese sulfate against, say, manganese chelate? Manganese sulfate works pretty instantly, and uh, the amount that you're dosing, you're not worried about overshooting the sulfates like you would with potassium or something or magnesium. So. Okay, okay, I didn't get okay. any other questions in chat before we uh, wrap up the show here. Alrighty, uh, anything else you got going on, Roger? Uh, shoot, I've been just lost. This has been a great night, uh, all these great questions and great answers. Uh, yeah, I thought of a couple things earlier, but right now I'm kind of lost in the show. So I don't really, you know, I'm we're we're working on the farm, and that's about it. Um, I'm really I'm really super happy about it. Um, I wonder. I did. Well, I did ask. I did want to. I have an idea. I had an idea from. Uh, it, it, but this is uh, goes against what we what we're selling and 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 the path we're on and for the show, but um, I wanted to know if there was a substitute possibly in a hydroponic situation where you would be using not totally water soluble sulfate of potash, if you could replace it with a potassium silicate or what would you replace it with that might be more water soluble and better for the uh, growing environment. Sorry, I was trying to respond to 
other chat here. Um, repeat the question. Oh my God. <laughs> Sorry, I'm trying to multitask here and, uh, yeah. and got, trying to make sure I don't miss anybody's questions. Well, if you wanted to re replace, if you were if you were doing hydroponics and you were using sulfate of potash and you wanted to replace that because it's not totally water soluble, what would you, you know, you know, one might think you might use, and you wanted to provide silica, you know, uh, could you use potassium silicate? And if not, what, you know, what would be the issues there? And if not, what would be something you could replace sulfate of potash with? So you could replace sulfate of potash depending on the amount that you needed to dose with. Uh, with with um, potassium chloride, if you didn't want to raise the pH, it's probably going to be your own, well, that or uh, MPK, monopotassium phosphate, um, if you also need to add phosphorus. Um, you could add monopotassium chloride if you were not adding a ton of it at once, or if you were, you know, you could use that to take away a percentage of your potassium sulfate. Uh, people often um, avoid chlorides kind of unnecessarily um, optimal chloride levels for optimal plant growth are between 90 and 110 ppms. So I do, you know, people often go completely overboard with the um, uh, trying to eliminate all chloride from the system when the plants actually need it for plant growth. Right. So, um, and so do your microbes, for instance, as well. So uh, people often will overdo it. So, could you ever use monopotassium phosphate in a hydropon in a aquaponics system? Yeah, absolutely. If you're trying to add phosphorus and potassium, and you were adding, you know, a crazy amount, yeah, absolutely. Cool. All right. Well, that's that's a part. So now, so the next question would be, how would I go about? See, I, if I could get a hold of uh, my old friend, he probably could come up with this, but he's the one that gave me the solution recipe and i have uh probably 35 to 40 pounds of mkp and let me tell you folks that's about 100 to 120 dollars a bag um i so i've got it so if i wanted so if i did that though i would have to let me see what else mono the, the phosphate so all right so how would i figure out how to um if the to provide the ppms of potassium that I'd be losing by omitting sulfate of potash. No, the potassium chloride, potassium sulfate, while not identical, will put in similar amounts of potassium. So oh, but I've got your dosage in my would water. be radically different. Huh? I've got chlorine in my water, so I'm talking about MPK. Oh, MKP, well, again, it would depend on how much potassium you need because you're adding potassium as well I and mean, you're going to overshoot the potassium for you overshoot the phosphorus i'm sorry i said that wrong i know we so that. we talked about this i'm getting tired now, this, now we'll um, yeah okay <laughs> so you would overshoot your phosphate before you would overshoot your potassium right so the phosphate would be become the issue um with that so it again you'd have to know what your baseline phosphate is but generally you don't want your phosphate max to be ever over really 50 or max 60 ppms. Um, so. And see, it's hard to tell what you're getting when you add MBK. And again, MBK. With, with hydro, hydro, you're running higher numbers than that, right? So. Um, well, I actually I, run I, lower numbers than what, what they baseline take. Is, or I'd have to know what your dose, if I looked at what your previous formulation was or what you dosed the previous time, I could. Yeah. Kind of backwards, figure out roughly what your your numbers were at the time. Yeah, so basically, basically I guess make solution and set them water test in. <laughs> well, that or I I don't even need a water test of your current thing. If I knew what you would dose on a hydroponic system, as long as I knew what you had dosed since the last time you had dumped the reservoir, I could more or less figure out within a range what the nutrients are. Right. As, we long as, what, used, as long we as I knew used. what your crop was, as long as I knew what your crop was and the number of plants. Right. We already used monopotassium phosphate in the past in our mix. So, 
we used to all chelates and boron and molybdenum and you know mpk and map and um you know of course like everybody calcium nitrate uh magnesium sulfate you know the same old, all that stuff and and uh just trying to run through the system a little bit uh to to you know to, to you know it's just I've, I've always felt bad about uh, leaving all that laying in a, you know, just laying uh, in a, you know, in a, in a, a bunch of storage crates, you know, and all that money I wasted, but we are, we're going to definitely, we're, we're, I, I tell you what, I'm so excited because we decided this week, well, we already knew this, but uh, well, I decided this week, basically that we're going to turn my greenhouse into an aquaponics greenhouse doing a dual root zone. Uh, we're going to build the system for that along with using up, you know, and, and growing stuff hydroponically for a while, while we are also adapting all our natural farming beds out back and around outside. And I've also got a um, half of my greenhouse section is going to be devoted to natural farming or, well, see, like I said, I'm going to do I want to do the and the aquaponics will probably help. Um, you know, I, I've got a lot in my head. You know, like Steve used to say, I don't really know. I can't tell. I can't say anymore. <laughs> but basically, it's like you know, like everybody's doing. I mean, even Steve is uh, doing you know, like testing where he's everything he does and do, he does. He's number one, hundred percent into dual root zone aquaponics, but you know, we all will grow any way we can. And, and we do these side by sides. And then there's no doubt when you question, you know, when you have a question, we could say, well, we did this, we grew it this way. So other than the do root zone aquaponics, I've grown every way you can pretty much grow. And so now I want to do the side by sides. And again, I think that's it's it's credence. You're willing to take a step back to move a step forward, and that's what's important this day and age. Because in the end, we just want to teach people how to grow food the most efficient way and in a way they can afford to. And um, yeah, I think the the uh, natural the dual root zone combining the natural, the fact that you once you get the fish tank and it's all living and you got your you got your aquaculture going on and it's really great. Then you, then you have your living soil or your natural farming, which doesn't always necessarily include worms and stuff, but I think it's still living soil. Maybe, I don't know. That's a uh, uh, debate for another day uh, because there's, there's a lot of debate about um, what is it? Uh, Dr. Lane is, uh, what is it? Um, um, food soil web. Right? Is that right? Soil food web? Which one? Yeah, it's late. <laughs> anyway, I'm done rambling on. You guys somebody, know I'm just a crazy dumbass, you know. So somebody asked why uh why dual roots on aquaponics over other stuff. Um so you can absolutely har get a plant that is harvestable in just a DWC or a media bed. The yield will be pretty crap. Marty and I have showed some pictures, uh, pretty good examples of pictures from Grow the Glue 4. There's another company out there that just does media beds that get some pretty pitiful, uh, pitiful yields with pretty low trichome counts compared to the ones that Marty and I get with the both all growing Grow the Glue 4. Um, uh, it, <laughs> the size of the buds are uh, like a pencil versus a, a Yeti microphone. You know, it's it's kind of a a noticeable difference almost three to four times the yield um so uh again that just goes back to show and, and marty just did the side by side right with the the no inputs the verma compost and then the verma compost plus mpk you can see they they'll they'll actually finish off right yeah you'll grow a plant but you're not actually getting something that's viable commercial yield and they'd actually look decent so, for most people but but what the, with the implemented or the supplemented plants, it's all different. I would say the short answer to your question was because it's, the upper zone, the soil to, zone allows you to supplement the plant with minerals that you couldn't supplement otherwise in the aquaponic system. Well, not only fit. that, you have that individual per plant or per strain control, right? So if I want to do 
um, eight different strains in one greenhouse bay or four different strains in one There's greenhouse good. bay, I can fine tune each of those different cultivars and actually maximize production without having to pull my hair out or just grow all of one strain in one bay or commit all of one system. So we can actually, you know, significantly maximize yield, uh, you know, uh, over not having that level of control, right? So again, this this goes to show that, you know, you have a lot of people trying to crack the same nut, but a lot of them just don't quite understand when you actually get to commercial production, hey, you actually need to have that level of control for each of your cultivars, or you're, you're, you're pissing away 15, 20% of your yield. Um, uh, and this this matters. If I'm spending money on a, a hundred thousand square feet, I need that extra to fifteen percent, right? So um, this is why you you, you got to account for this kind of stuff, and uh, you know you got to look out for the people that aren't doing that kind of stuff. All yeah. Right. So like, um, say I'm exhausted. Right, I have a very important email I need to write before the end of the night. Uh, so we will wrap things up. Um, why don't you tell everybody how to find your uh, Roger? Well, you can come and join uh, I Love Growing Marijuana dot com on the forum. We got an excellent forum. Um, you know, we got uh, over five, six hundred uh, blog articles all about growing cannabis and and actually different thing, uh, different blogs about uh, state rights or state laws. We also um, have an excellent forum where it's not like most of the cannabis forums you've been on. We don't allow any backbiting or inner fighting or politics or anything like that. It's merely to come there and learn how to grow and or provide information for other members. If you're one of those people that would love to come out and you feel like you're a, a, a really good grower or an expert grower and you have nowhere to, you know, there's nothing you can feel better than about once you teach somebody to grow a plant and they grow a plant and they're successful. That's one of the greatest feelings you could ever have in your life. And if you can get them to where they have a continuous thing. So, so there, and yeah, uh, right now I'll just leave it at that. Um, I don't do Instagram much anymore because it's all about videos or pictures and I'm more about communication. So, you know, you can reach me at Latewood at Latewood.com if you want to. Awesome. And uh, you can find uh, find out more if you need nutrients at truealkaponics.com. Uh, and you can find out me at poetponics, uh, poetponics.com, YouTube, SoundCloud, iTunes, and your favorite podcast app. Um, be sure to check out the awesome content from last week's show. Uh, we had quite a cool guest list. And uh, we'll be back again on Thursday uh, with... Uh, I don't know who yet, but somebody <laughs> cool. I, we got a couple of cool people on the. Like, I, I got some people in the queue. There's some people from the old queue from when I was in Africa that we just never got around to. Oh man, um, that'd be cool. That'd so, be really cool. Uh, I also got a couple of cool people that uh, finally got some cool contacts for some people we've been trying to get on the show that you guys, I'm sure, have heard of before. So that'll be cool as well. Um, and. Uh, also on the 20th, uh, I think we might be doing a live event. Yes, we're doing a live episode from a super secret cannabis event. Uh, That's next held Wednesday. Somewhere within the United States. No. Next Friday, Saturday? Next Saturday, we'll be doing a yeah. super, super secret live episode from a secret location. Ooh. So that'll be awesome. And uh, yeah, I'm trying to think if there's anything else going on right now. I think that's it. Thanks for watching. Make sure that like and subscribe button. Um, and uh, yeah, go out and support our other fellow cannabis people and uh, make sure you, uh, you know, our cannabis industry is doing a little bit better than a lot of other people's industries right now, given the current uh, strife in our, our country and uh, the, the, the pandemic. So, uh, if, you know, if you got a couple extra bucks and you're doing real all right in the cannabis industry, tip people a couple extra bucks. Not everybody else is doing as good as our industry is. So, uh, a rising tide floats all boats. Uh, so we'll end on that. Have a good night. Take care and be 